Properties of molecules and solutions. Water is a solvent. So water has a lot of unique properties among liquids that makes it really the ideal environment for life to happen. When we go to other planets and we look for life, we look for water, right? Our knowledge about life is entirely in an aqueous context. We think about life as requiring water to happen. So when we look for life, we look for water. Some properties that make water good at what it does are, it has a high heat capacity as well as a high specific heat. It's capable of holding on to heat really well. And it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. Once you get water to a certain temperature, it takes a lot to adjust the temperature of that water. Think about how long it takes to boil a big pot of water. It takes kind of a long time. When we talk about um, the ice caps melting and, the, and, and climate change happening, one of the difficult things about this or the, the um, less intuitive things about this is that since the, the planet is so much water, the fact that our temperature is changing means that all that water, oceans and oceans of water, have absorbed so much energy from industrial output that the oceans are changing temperatures. These are our main temperature drivers of the planet. It's hard to overestimate just how much energy we had to put into a system for that to happen. And what a big deal it is because the oceans, now that they have this extra energy, are disinclined to change their temperature. They need a really serious reprieve of high temperatures to come back down to something more normal. Your body is like 70% water. So it takes a fair bit once you have warmed it up to a certain point, it takes a fair bit for that water to cool down or to heat more back, heat back up again. Water has a high heat of vaporization, meaning for water to evaporate, you require a lot higher of a temperature than some other liquids. If you take two glasses and you pour water into one and rubbing alcohol into the other and wait to see which evaporates fastest, the rubbing alcohol is going to evaporate way before the glass of water does. Eventually the glass of water will evaporate, but it's going to take a long time. It has polar solvent properties. Water is a polar molecule. You have a partially negative end where electrons just tend to hang out more and a partially positive end around the hydrogens where electrons hang out a little less frequently. Because you have a negative-ish end and a positive-ish end, they like to bump into each other and make these partial fleeting weak little bonds. If you throw other partially charged stuff in there, it wants to make these bonds too. If you throw fully um, uh, charged things like sodium chloride, table salt, you have a full positive and a full negative because an electron got stolen in there. Those dissolve great. Polar, pro polar um, uh, liquids are really good at dissolving things. For our purposes, salts are going to be any kind of um, ionically bonded molecules like sodium and chloride. Electrolytes are usually the broken down products of those dissolved salts. So calcium, for example, tends to show up in your body as being positively charged. You didn't get, you didn't ingest pure calcium. You ingested calcium covalent, um, ionically bonded to something else and it ended up getting broken off those loose sort of um, ions or electrolytes. It's um, not terribly reactive in and of itself. So you can have a lot of chemical reactions happening in it without actually changing the environment too terribly much. And importantly, and often overlooked, it is incompressible. You cannot compress water. When we think about water under pressure, what we're really thinking about is a situation in which you've taken a container and you've put liquid in it, and then you injected a bunch of extra gas into it, into the same volume, so that when you crack it open, the champagne bottle, for example, that gas bursts out of it, and it might bring some liquid with it. But the liquid there, that water content, did not in and of itself compress. The gas inside the container did. What this means is that if you have a cell that's this big, and you apply some sort of pressure to it, it's not going to squish. It might deform a little bit. If you put enough down, you might break the membrane and the water content will all come spilling out, but the water in and of itself will not compress. 
the molecules inside of that um, cell, therefore, aren't going to really get squished. So when um, you put certain molecules into water, they might dissociate a little bit. They might break down and release hydrogens into water. They don't always, but some things when put into water will release hydrogens. Some things when put into water will um, effectively take up protons. This is sort of a two step process though. Molecules, salts really, that release hydrogens, that have hydrogens that are ionically bonded to something else, you put it into a polar situation like water, it, the things break apart and you have these loose hydrogens floating around in the water, are called acids. Strong acids are ones in, are molecules in which the molecules, like hydrochloric acid here, dissociate completely and irreversibly. Once you split up the hydrogen and the chlorine in a water environment, Unless they come really close together, they're not going to bond again, and even then it's only going to be for a hot second. Weak acids will dissociate incompletely. Hydrogens will pop off, hydrogens will pop back on. They don't stay apart quite like a strong acid in that water. Salts placed in water that release a hydroxide, which can then attract a hydrogen, are called bases. So, sodium hydroxide, why? Okay, you take this salt between a sodium and a hydroxide group. Sodium is positively charged, hydroxide is negatively charged. Put it into a polar situation like water, and they split apart. This OH will then go and attract hydrogens there's going to be some free hydrogens floating around from whatever acids are there. The um, hydroxide group and the um, hydrogen ion, the proton, will covalently bond and become H2O. So it's a two-step process. Acids releasing protons in water, proton donors, it just breaks up and now you have loose protons. Bases have a two-step process where it breaks up in water, because that's what salts do, and then in one of those parts is a hydroxide group, and that hydroxide group will then take up hydrogens. You have a certain amount of acid content and basic content in water kind of at all times as molecules are bouncing around. You can sort of have these free um, little bits here and there. The fact that you have a balance of hydroxides and hydrogens so that you have a solution that's overwhelmingly just H2O molecules means that it's neutral. It does not have an acidic or basic nature as an overall solution. Solutions in which this is happening more are more acidic. Solutions where you have this happening more are more basic. The more often you have this happening because you, the more extra stuff you put in the water, or the stronger what you put in the water is, the more completely it dissociates, the more acidic or basic a solution will get. So we register um, acidity or basicness on a pH scale. Water, as we mentioned, has a pH that's neutral because you have an equal amount of H's, H, uh, a balanced ratio of H's and O's. It's neither acidic nor is it basic. All of this scale is in relation to water. So things that have, that will give off more hydrogens in water are more acidic. Ones that give off more hydroxide groups, which, which then can attract other hydrogens, it picks up the free hydrogens, are more basic. Lower numbers are acidic. So something super acidic would be like a one. Bases have high numbers. So something super acidic is like a 13 or a 14. If there is something at zero, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> when you put something in a solution of water that gives off a bunch of hydrogens and something else that will, to the same degree, 
take up extra hydrogens. This will balance out and you'll end up with a neutral solution. When you put baking soda and vinegar in a solution together, baking soda is like a pH of nine, vinegar is like a five. When you mix those two together, they're going to react with one another and ultimately end up in a neutral place. Buffers are liquids that are added to water that help aid in pH change resistance. It makes it harder for pH changes to happen. Some buffers, when you, um, if you put, if you take a, a solution that's pretty basic and you put certain buffers in it, that buffer will give off hydrogens to counteract all the extra basic hydroxide groups to neutralize things. Most of your body fluids have buffers. All of your enzymes, all of your proteins, all of your cellular components work best within a fairly narrow pH range, slightly south of neutral, slightly basic of neutral. To keep your pH in the range that your proteins work best in, you need a lot of buffers. So your blood has a lot of buffers in it, your lymph, your lymphatic fluids have a lot of buffers in it. Your interstitial fluids, that's all the liquid that's in between your different cells and stuff, are all very heavily saturated in buffers. You want to make sure that you don't have too many hydrogens floating around, bumping into things and causing reactions. They're just loose protons after all. They're going to bounce around and do all kinds of havoc because they could bond with just about anything. You want to be able to resist that. And you also don't want to have too much of um, something going on that can overly suck up hydrogens that you might need for your other metabolic reactions. This buffer content is really, really important in life. Molecules can be made of one part or many parts. A monomer refers to one part. Oops. You have a molecule that has just one component to it. Examples of mon uh, monomers include glucose. You can see that's just one ring. Fructose, which is also one ring. And the other stuff is just like branches on that ring. And galactose. These are the three mono sugars, simple sugars, or monosaccharides. Di refers to two parts, the prefix di. So if you bond two monomers together covalently, you will end up with one larger molecule made up of those two monomers, an anabolic reaction. This is sucrose, a glucose and a fructose. A, a sugar and a fruit sugar comes up with, turns into sucrose. Try, um, this one down here below is galactose and glucose and um, that's a milk sugar. Tri refers to three parts. A triglyceride, not sure why this keeps disappearing, is a fatty acid made up of three glycerols. And poly just means many. Anything over three parts is poly. <clears throat> so monosaccharide, disaccharide, trisaccharide, or polysaccharide. What you have down here, if each one of these little green guys is a glucose, you can see there's like a zillion of them, right? And they all branch off and they're all bonded to one another covalently. This is a polysaccharide known as um, glucagon. Glucagon, so if you consume something and you get sugar in your bloodstream, but you can't use all that sugar, your body's going to want to pack it away somewhere fairly densely for another day. It's sort of the intermediate step between sugar and fat, so <clears throat> or any kind of calories and um, incoming calories and fat. And it's this long branchy um, chain of glucose molecules. Uh, starch looks very similar to that. Monomers can be made into polymers by dehydration synthesis. Polymers can be broken down into monomers by hydrolysis. Notice the difference in terminology a little bit. Can be made into 
and can be broken down into. Monomers becoming polymers by the process of dehydration synthesis can be made into, can be built into, is an anabolic process. Polymers can be broken down into monomers, big multi multi-molecule molecules, can be broken down into single molecular units, that is a catabolic process. Take a look too at the terms for what we're doing. The anabolic process is called dehydration synthesis. <clears throat> if you take that literally, you are building things by taking away water. Polymers can be broken down into monomers by hydrolysis. Hydro refers to water and lysis is breaking down or just breaking. Monomers can be made into polymers by taking, <clears throat> excuse me, two H's and an O from somewhere in the middle of the molecule and you use an enzyme to do this. Covalent bonds are the strongest bonds in an aqueous environment. In practice, they don't break spontaneously. They will eventually, with given enough time or if you put in enough energy, but I mean, practically speaking, it's just not gonna happen. So you use an enzyme to break down um, covalent bonds. An enzyme will come in here, find two H's and an O in the middle, and pop them off into a water molecule. <clears throat> now, so you have these two molecules, found the H's and the O's. Now what you're left with is this sort of naked end that wants to make a bond because you got rid of its hydrogen and this naked end that wants to bond with something because you got rid of its hydroxide group. Now these two molecules are going to bond. Now the edges have the right atoms and the right configurations such that they want to bond with each other. So by the enzyme coming in and popping off that water, you leave these freed up ends that can bond to one another and create one larger molecule. Dehydration synthesis involves removing a water molecule between two molecules so that they can bond into one bigger molecule. You're removing something to build something up, removing a water to make a bigger molecule. Hydrolysis is exactly the opposite. You take that big molecule and an enzyme comes in and forces two H's and O in somewhere in the middle. It changes shape, it does some other tricks to lower the activation energy to make this happen. <clears throat> but ultimately, it forces two H's and an O into there. That's going to take the place of the bonds that these two share. And since that bond no longer exists, it was replaced with water, some atoms from water it breaks down into two smaller molecules. One big molecule is broken up by water. Water comes in, breaks up a big molecule into two smaller parts. Hydrolysis is bringing in water to break things up. Dehydra dehydration synthesis is pulling out a water to build things up. And finally, just to touch on enzymes one more time, enzymes don't make reactions happen. They do not force anything to happen. They don't start anything to happen. Chemical reactions that can happen spontaneously can theoretically happen spontaneously. But again, in order for that spontaneous reaction to happen, you might need so much time or energy put into the system that, I mean, practically speaking, you just don't have or can't afford. All energies have an energy, all reactions have an energy requirement to happen. Again, that might be too much for the cell to handle. And a reaction has to overcome this energy hump to happen. An enzyme just lowers the energy hump to make it to help a reaction that would otherwise spontaneously happen happen. So if you consider the bump in front of the ball here is the activation energy, the amount of a hurdle, the amount of obstruction for a chemical reaction to happen, and the ball falling falling down the hill is the reaction. In the cell, when you have a covalent bond in front of you, that hill is high. 
the ball could go up and over. It's possible, but that hill is just too much for practical purposes. So what an enzyme does is it comes in and it makes that hill smaller. Again, usually by just rearranging some things or changing the shape of some things so that the right atoms are next to each other. Once that energy hump is lower, this ball is now able to much more easily roll down the hill and do what it's going to do. One more time, just for the sake of being redundant, enzymes help a reaction that could spontaneously happen, happen, but with less energy. And frankly, within the amount of energy that you have available to you in the cell without destroying the cell in the process. Enzymes are going to be overwhelmingly found during situations in which you need to build or break down certain kinds of covalent bonds. You don't really need enzymes so much for hydrogen bonding or ionic bonds, but you do definitely need them to break covalent bonds and sometimes to help build them too.